Welcome to the Working Money Podcast. I'm your host, Michelle Wong. I'm your co-host, Willie Morales. Each week, we talk to people, either on the internet, through the phone, or in person. We try to get the best business minds on this podcast. Thanks for joining us. Subscribe on iTunes, and please enjoy the show. We have a great great guest today. His name is Anton Glotzer, and he is owner of an oil company. Mm -hmm. Welcome to the show, Anton. It's a pleasure. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I've I've been doing, I've had my own company since I graduated college 10 years ago. Uh, I started in real estate. I did that for uh, a little over 10 years now, like 11 years. And uh, the last three years, I switched from real estate and into oil. You know, I still do real estate occasionally, but I even kind of switched out of that and into mortgage notes. Uh, but primarily, uh, as far as all my assets, I sold them and uh, got into the oil business. What, what made you change from the real estate industry to oil and gas? Uh, hey, you hated dealing with tenants and uh, toilets, as they say? Um, well, not really that, but that's not what actually caused me to change. the. The reason I made my decision is because the you can make a lot more money in oil and gas a lot faster. The returns are just much higher okay. in the oil and gas industry than it is in the in the real estate industry. You know, obviously, if you get in at the right price, if you buy it right, yes, the returns are normally at least double, if not quadruple, on average, what they are in real estate. Um, wow, I didn't know that. Uh, did you, um, when you when you decided to make that switch, um, how far or um, did you know already about the oil industry when you right before you made that switch? Were you doing both at the same time, the real estate and the oil uh, investing? Um, well, I didn't. I didn't really. I mean, I've read a lot of books on the industry. You know, um, I know some, I knew some people who are already doing it. Uh, some people who, you know, had big publicly traded companies as well as guys that just had little businesses in the oil industry. But, you know, I personally tried to do oil, you know, for a long time as a broker, you know, where brokering, uh, buying, you know, from one country, selling to another. And that has literally never, ever panned out. Uh, I learned that most of these brokering deals that you can find on the internet, about 99.99% of them were bullshit. You know, most oh, people, wow. it's, it's, if you have, the way, you know, one of my buddies described it to me is, uh, if I have a, 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 a BMW dealership, I'm not gonna call you and ask me to help me sell my BMWs, I'm gonna call the people that are already involved in doing that. Was there any issues for you, the you know, and starting uh, the, the oil company? Did you have any issues, you know, financial uh, issues well, with that? Or? Initially, I bought my first deal with uh, two investors. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my, my personal uh, input into the deal, uh, into the bu in buying the actual oil wells. I did a couple of uh, oil field equipment projects prior to getting mm -hmm. into the actual wells. Uh, and those turn out to be pretty successful. But then uh, two years ago, that whole uh, equipment industry collapsed mm -hmm. because the prices collapsed and there was basically all the buyers just disappeared. Um, so we bought the first oil wells. Uh, you know, my, I only put up $50,000, which, you know, most people, when you tell them, you know, I got into the oil industry, it's 50 grand. They'll, they ask me, like, don't you need five or 50 million? You know, and the reality is you don't. Mm -hmm. um, you, you do if you want to start a you know giant company and compete with Exxon Mobil or Chevron immediately. Then yeah, you need big money. But there's a lot of independent producers. In fact, I would say hundreds of thousands of them in America, mm -hmm. in the Midwest. That you know we living in New York City and other big uh, metropolitan areas, we don't get exposed to that because you know you don't just drive by an oil well in Manhattan. Mm -hmm. that often or ever actually mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you go anywhere even in new york you go upstate new york there's half a million more than half a million oil wells just mm -hmm. two miles north of manhattan two miles north of new york city 
You know, um, Pennsylvania has more oil wells than Texas. Wow. wow. You hear that? You hear that, Willie? Uh, <laughs> get into oil. Get into Michelle. oil. Here's Michelle now. She wants to get <laughs> real estate and get into oil. I knew it. I knew that was going to happen, Anton. <laughs> So, no, uh, you know, we would, I'm just kidding. Uh, it, I'm just saying that because, you know, we're concentrated in Philadelphia with real estate. So I'm just, I'm thinking, oh, okay, Pennsylvania. Okay, that would be, that would be perfect, getting to oil. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, you have more stringent uh, environmental regulations than we do here in the Midwest. But yeah, there's actually, you know, PA is the original oil boom capital of the world not Texas. And, and, it's, and it's funny though, Anton, because you always hear, you know, Texas and oil and Oklahoma, like I think where you're in now. But yeah, you don't hear anything of, anymore about Pennsylvania or Ohio. Uh, pretty much you always hear about Texas, Oklahoma. Uh, I'm trying to think of any other places in the United Alaska, States. Alaska, California. Yeah. Um, are, are those states, Pennsylvania and Ohio, are there not boom ready for oil or it's not that they're not they're still producing i mean they're like i said there's probably over half a million wells in each one of those states that are marginal wells meaning that they're producing uh, under 10 barrels per individual well per day you know okay. which still you know at 40 dollar oil that's 400 dollars a day uh right. you're talking. it's not too bad right or something that costs you maybe Five hundred dollars a month to manage, you know. I see. Yeah. Um, but the fact is, to drill, to do any new projects, is just a lot more difficult to do it in the northeast and in the north, uh, mainly due to the political situation with the uh, Envir EPA and other agencies. It's just um, there's more, I guess, not paperwork, and there's more stringent rules. And most people don't want to have an oil well in their backyard because it's not, it's no longer a big part of the, you know, uh, jobs market for the state. For example, in Oklahoma, you know, one out of every four jobs is in the oil industry. So there is no, you know, the, the state, the government is not going to say, you know, don't do anything because, you know, we want the environment clean or whatever, uh, which is a whole different topic, which, a lot of that environmental crap is just nonsense. Uh, but, you know, they can't say that to us because, you know, the state's income depends on these oil jobs. Right. In PA, it's maybe one out of every 16 jobs is in the oil industry. You know, so they can basically tell people to, you know, shut down or give them a lot of headaches and hassle. And, and it's the same thing with the mining industry and the coal industry as well. You know, there is a lot of new improvements in technology, but the reality is that a lot of those guys that are protesting out there with signs, you know, save the earth and whatever, they don't know that. They're not in that industry and they don't really care. You know, they're all pro-environment, but oil industry, you know, we don't, I don't want to live in a crappy environment, you know. Right. I have to breathe the same air as everybody else does. I have to drink the same water as everybody else does. It isn't like we don't want it. Uh, it's just the reality is, you know, we, uh, we're trying to make money and it's in a lot of those other places, it is very difficult to balance that, to balance profitability and uh, regulation. With the oil prices low, um, is that a, a, a perfect scenario for you to invest more or you uh, yeah. to the oil prices? Uh, right now, uh, as of last, you know, time I checked the uh, prices, it's oil is like $44. I think it went up to 52 uh, a couple of weeks ago or two weeks ago. And now it kind of crashed because of the election. Regardless of who gets elected, in the long run, the price of oil will go up. You know, unlike other businesses, unlike real estate, oil is, uh, is a mining business. And there is a, you're buying a finite resource, you know, uh, just due to the inflation alone, the economic state that the price goes up. And if you look at it historically, uh, the price of oil has kind of gone in tandem with the value of the dollar. So, as, so while the dollar goes up, uh, and it always does with inflation, uh, between 3 and 5%, depending on how you calculate it, you know, so does oil. So 
Uh, right now, just like in real estate, when the real estate is down, it's a good time to get in because it's only got a, you know, it can only go up. Same thing in oil. It can theoretically can only go down to zero. Not that it ever will. I mean, if oil goes below $20, uh, the thing with oil, you know, we can just shut, turn off the tap, which I've done actually. We've done when the oil was $30. A couple of my deals, you know, the first deal actually we bought, we bought it too high. It wasn't economical to produce it at $30 because, you know, I don't, you know, the market is 30 bucks, but that's not what I got paid. I have, you know, there's uh, fees that I have to pay for transportation and other things. So I make less than that. So I can just go turn it off. It doesn't cost me any money to turn it off. It costs me, you know, I'm, I'm sitting on it, I'm waiting, and I'm not making any money while I'm waiting, but, but I'm not expending any money. You know, it doesn't, it, like I said, if you have the means to just sit and wait, a lot of people are doing that. And maybe not so much anymore, but for time, people would just shut off their wells and they produce the bare minimum to keep their lease, which is, you know, maybe one load a year, if that. Uh, it's not that much. So, you know, the realistically, what I'm saying is the price of oil can't go down that much more and it can only go up. So if you know, knowing that, buying really anything uh, at the at right price with the right team, which is very important in the oil industry, um, you'll make money. Let's say if somebody wanted to get into the oil industry, would you recommend them getting into oil stocks? Well, it's so it, just investing in stocks or futures or you know any kind of commodity like that, that's very different than investing into a physical asset. The, mm -hmm. the main difference is actually uh, the taxation wise. So in the oil industry, your taxes are 100%, your entire investment, completely tax deductible, 100% of it. If you're drilling, it's all of it is tax deductible within the first year. If you're buying an existing property, it's a depreciation schedule of seven years for the equipment. Uh, and then there is a production credit, which is indefinite. Plus, 15% uh, of your income, so for every dollar that you earn from oil sales, 15 cents of it is tax-free. Okay. And then on top of that, for every barrel or MCF of gas that you produce, the government actually refunds you a couple of dollars, which that varies, uh, you know, year by year. So I don't know exactly what it is, but I know it's anywhere between two and four dollars. I see. That's another tax credit. And um, also with real estate, you can do a 1031 exchange, sell your house, buy an oil well and vice versa without paying taxes in between. All of this is completely legal, and I've done that. Right. So he's, he's, he's writing it down, so he piqued his interest. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you know what it is, though, Anton? It, that's a, it's just a different industry. You're the first person that I know of that um, has gotten into this type of business. Nobody really talks about it. Uh, you know, I guess people are afraid of oil because of, of, of gas prices or, you know, the barrel, the, you know, uh, paying more than $44 a barrel. So, you know, it depends who I, you know, you listen to. If I see, listen to CNBC, depending who's on it, somebody's going to, you know, talk something bad about uh, oil and gas. Well, you know, you're giving it a positive light. Well, you know, you don't usually get people on the news networks that, are independent producers. You get some CEO from a big company. You know, exactly. That's and people look at that and they say, "Well, you know, I can't get into it. I can go work for the company, maybe, uh, you know, if I have the right background or something." But it's not exactly an easy thing to just become a CEO of BP or Shell. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> the, you're either born in the right family, or you at least, you know, spend a couple of decades in the right business, in the, in knowing the right people to get to that position. Or, you know, you start off as a couple of billion dollars to get there. Uh, but, yeah, the reality is uh, there is, you know, hundreds of thousands of Americans in America that own a couple of oil wells here and there that might have, you know, especially in the, in the Midwest, especially, you know, in the Bible Belt and all these uh, areas that, you know, they were just born in the right place at the right time, literally. You, you know, I mean, a lot of these guys are farmers that just happen to have oil under their feet. You know, one day somebody came in and said, I want to prospect your land. 
and I'm going to pay you royalties or you, I'll partner up with you and to drill your, uh, your property. And, you know, next thing you know, you wake up a millionaire just because you were right. born on the right farm, right piece of farmland. Right. You know? So, so when you get into, because, you know, it's funny because uh, you always hear about, uh, again, it depends who you talk to, uh, you know, how great investing in real estate is compared to stocks and all that. But, you know, Anton, if the market crashes, you know, you got your property is now, you know, you owe more than your property is worth. Mm -hmm. um, you're dealing with tenants that might not pay because they might lose their job, depending what, you know, if they're in a city like Detroit. To me, hearing, hearing what you're saying, you know, you can hedge your bet with, with oil and gas a little bit. I mean, I think so, going to what you said, compared to real estate. Yeah, and, 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 and a lot of people who are professional real estate investors do that very often. In fact, most of the people that I have as my investors, actually not most, all of them, they're all from real estate backgrounds. They're all real estate investors originally. In fact, uh, you know, one of the greatest real estate investors, Robert Kiyosaki, if you watch any of his talks on YouTube, half his speech is about oil. Yeah, exactly. The guy He's showed up fast. Yeah. I get I got into oil as soon as I could afford it. <laughs> Years ago. So um you know it, it's it's uh it's it is definitely a good uh hedger. Uh the key thing in, in the oil industry, which is a little bit different than in real estate, but I guess it's the same in any business, is to have the right partner if you are investing directly into oil wells. And you know, I've had some bad partners initially. I don't have any more. But if you're not there, if you plan to be an absentee investor, you really need to make sure that you trust the people that you're working with because uh, there is a couple of ways you can get e screwed on an oil deal very easily, and a lot of people do. And I'm not talking about just, you know, promoters out there, and there's a lot of those, especially out in Texas, because there's a lot of foreign money coming into Texas, unlike Oklahoma. Um, there's a lot of promoters are going out there and you know promoting these deals and they don't care if you make money or lose money because they get their commission it's like a broker mm -hmm. you know broker sells your house they don't give a shit if the price goes up or down they got paid they're out uh, so you want to make sure the people that you're working with uh, have some sort of equity stake in the property and you also want to make sure that they're trustworthy on top of that because uh, like I said, there is ways that you can sell oil even at a loss to a reclaimer without, you know, recording it officially. And there is operators out there that are just straight up crooked and we'll take your money and we'll screw you. Right. So unless you know them really well or you trust them really well, don't just jump into it. And, uh, you know, you could become your own operator. It, there is a fee you have to pay. Uh, there's a couple of, uh, you know, you have to get insurance, you have to get uh, specific uh, paperwork in place, and then you can manage your own oil wells. Uh, is it the best solution? It is if you know what you're doing. It's not right. the best solution for everybody, but if you know what you're doing, if you have the right people, then yes, you should just do that. Otherwise, if you're gonna have somebody else manage your wells, make sure you trust the manager, because uh, you can get screwed. In all this time that you've been in the oil business, what do you recall has been one of your pitfalls and what do you recall has been one of your highlights? Uh, my pitfalls is uh, my first deal, first couple of deals, I trusted the people that I was working with and they were uh, a tad disingenuous about both their expertise and the product that they were selling me. So, like I said, I bought some deals that you know, I, I think in the long run, I'll still make money with them. Mm -hmm. But right now, we're just kind of breaking even. I overpaid mm -hmm. on the first project. Uh, mm -hmm. I had a guy who was literally stealing oil on the second deal. Oh, uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> He's being sued now. Um, I had a guy that uh, was an operator who just basically never showed up to his job. <laughs> even though he charged me money. And again, it's one of those things that if you're not there, Mm -hmm. Unless you trust them, they can literally not show up and you don't know. 
Now, it yeah. just happened, in this particular case, it wasn't such a big deal because it's a gas well and there was no moving parts, it's just free flowing gas. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I need to show up. But it's kind of the only issue that, again, I haven't had the problem yet. But if mm -hmm. you don't show up, the grass, you know, there's grass that's growing. And the Corporation Commission, which is the people that are, it's a government agency that's responsible in checking up on the oil wells. Mm -hmm. If they don't have access to it and they can say that the grass is too high, you'll get yeah. fined. Sort of like if you have, you know, if you live in a, a residential area and your grass is all messed up, you get fined for that too. It's kind of like that, but for a different reason. Okay. Um, well, okay. So and, I haven't got fired? fined, but I've had that issue. Okay. Um, but you know what? It's a learning experience. At least uh, right. it's, it's better that you learn in the beginning than towards the end. Um, you know, you take that and now you know what to look for, what red flags and, you know, uh, overall, uh, what to expect with the net, you know, with the next person or the next deal that you come across. But, um, out of that, like, what do you recall then what has been like a highlight for you? Like what, what has been like the best thing that's happened? So, you know, that you've recalled in all of this time. A uh, highlight would be the last couple of deals that I've done were really the last, all the deals that I did pretty much this year, um, except for maybe one, were good. I mean, they're, I'm making a ton of money right now from okay. this stuff because I bought them at the right price. Mm -hmm. they, uh, you know, you have to, the other thing was oil, it's, especially when you're buying marginal wells, you need to have a budget on top of what you are paying for the deal. So if you're paying, you know, 50 grand or a hundred grand, mm -hmm. you have at least 20, 25 or 50,000 even mm -hmm. in your budget, which you can go and reinvest in the projects. And we didn't do that initially. That was a mistake that I made. Mm -hmm. we, again, because the guy that I bought it was said that, Oh, you know, it's not a big deal. Just buy it and it'll be running the way it is. Mm -hmm. And that's usually not the case, especially a lot of these older wells, there's moving parts, they break down. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't have the money to repair them and upgrade things, then, you know, you cannot, you, your production can go down or you could just straight up lose money. And a lot of people, uh, even people that have been in the industry for a long, long time, they face that same exact issue. They, limp, they simply run out of money. I know a guy right now in Texas, he's got a well that was valued at $10 million just three years ago. Mm -hmm. Today, he's making like maybe 10 barrels a day or something like that. Wow. It's nothing. And he doesn't even have the money to go, you know, turn any of these things on or repair them. Wow. And this guy is 80, 83 years old, you know? Oh, mm -hmm. He's almost gonna die soon. And I'm trying <laughs> to buy this deal from him for, you know, I'm not gonna name the price, but it's, it's a lot less than $10 million. <laughs> right. Okay. You know, a couple of zeros less. <laughs> okay. But, no, but listen, you know, uh, kudos to you. I mean, the, I, I give you a lot of respect for that, you know. Um, so, Anton, but what are the, you know, for, for then for a newbie that wants to get into the oil business and might not have the twenty five, thirty five, fifty five thousand, whatever to get in, what would you recommend for them? Well, like one of the things that I offer to some of my investors is we will buy a project, uh, you know, and we do this with smaller deals. We just did a deal recently, uh, $200,000, produces seven barrels of oil a day, and it produces enough gas that it pays all the expenses and then there's money left over. So, you know, I petitioned that deal, you know, if you want to get 10%, that's only 20 grand. That's, you know, most people, they can afford that as you know as a sample as a sample deal okay you know as, as a first time investment project in the world it's not that much money you know twenty thousand dollars is uh maybe a lot of money for a lot of people but it's not a lot of money for a lot of people as well right. so no we i mean we've seen michelle and i we talked about franchises that are a couple of hundred thousand like your mcdonald's and uh right. McDonald's a million yeah. dollars. Yeah, exactly. So, like you said, twenty thousand uh, shouldn't be that bad for a newbie to get in, even if they partner up with a couple of people to to produce the twenty thousand. 
Yeah, and, and your, your return on like that deal is over 30%. Oh, wow, okay. Annual. You right. know, and that's and that's considering the price of oil is forty dollars. Right. So if oil price goes up, you know, to sixty dollars or seventy dollars, you double. You're now making sixty percent return. Right. You know, if it goes down for every for every uh, ten dollar oil price goes up, you you make about five additional percent return on investment. And with gas, it's even more because gas is at like two dollars. So right. if gas goes up to three dollars, you know that's a fifty percent increase in your ROI. That's right. huge. And you look at the gas history at high point; it was at twelve bucks. That means if you buy a deal that's producing gas, and gas projects are much simpler than oil because they're just they're easier. And unlike oil, where people can actually steal oil, well, it is an extremely high crime on par to murder in Oklahoma. It, and in the Midwest, gas really? is almost impossible to steal. Gas is sold okay. directly into the pipeline, directly to the refinery. You don't get paid by your manager. Uh, you get paid by the refinery. In, in both cases, you can actually have the checks be mailed to you by uh, the actual guy who's purchasing the oil and or gas, which is how we set it up. But not everybody does. A lot of operators, they choose to collect the money first and then do the disbursements themselves. This way, you know, they don't get stiffed on the bill by a deadbeat investor, uh, which makes sense in both ways. We, we don't have that issue. Uh, we set up an escrow account. So, you know, if somebody doesn't pay, we can just take it out of the escrow account. Oh, that's right. Right. You know, yeah. uh, and then the payments, the actual investors, they get paid by the people who are buying the oil and gas. And in, the, in, the, in, in gas, like I said, it literally goes from the hole in the ground, from the well, right into the refinery via pipe. And there's a little meter that shows you how much gas you're making every day. That's it. There's no, you know, unless you cut into that pipe, there's no way to steal the gas. So in that respect, it's just a safer deal. And a lot of these gas wells, you may not need um, a pump check. It might just be free flowing. You probably won't, you know, again, depends. Every well is different. But like I have some wells that are gas wells that are free flowing. You know, if somebody doesn't go, if my pumper doesn't check it out, you know, it's not a big deal. Nothing's going to happen to it. There's no oil leaks. There's no oil. You know, the only thing that can happen is if there's overpressurized and this thing explodes. But that literally almost never happens, like one in a million chances, you know, especially with these marginal wells. It's right. almost a If you had the chance to start, over again, what would you do differently? Listen more to my consultants. And I do have, I have now a bunch of different oil and gas consultants. And since I have started listening to them and their expertise, I've actually been doing a lot better. <laughs> okay. Well, that's good. Yeah. That's good. We're getting into Willie's favorite part. And so what books you recommend or what books it got you started in investing in uh, oil and gas? Um, well, there's Oil 101 um, that's written by a guy who is actually one of my, um, uh, uh, not mentors, but he's one of my advisors. Uh, he's a, he lives in New York City. He's, um, <laughs> the name escapes me at the moment, but uh, if you go on, the, on my website, you can actually see him. Uh, it's, it's one of those books that uh, a lot of the college kids that are going into the oil and gas industry that's basically a requirement uh there's a book that i wrote again it's not really a super detailed book uh and that's a free download that i can send to michelle and uh you, you can have that sure uh, it's also on my website it's a free download like i said uh there is uh again depending on specifically which part of oil industry that you want to start in there's a lot of books on stock and futures um uh, trading mm -hmm. uh which you know, I'm not going to read many of those because that's not, while well, I have read a lot of them, um, the best book on stock investments I can recommend is the one written by Warren Buffett, you know, uh, which is basically just uh, invest uh, slowly and wisely and don't expect huge returns immediately. You know, and, and if you're going to do it, so, something just, you know, uh, invest in the value of the prop of the company 
rather than uh, the you know the technicals. Right. You know, you can buy and sell and trade with the technicals, but uh, the fundamentals are what you're investing in. Um, and that, that is the consensus of the book. You know, you don't need to read a, a 500 page book. I just told you what it's about. Right. Well, I mean, but which book is that one by Warren Buffett? Which one is? Uh, well, the, the one that I like the most is a snowball, which is more about the, his life, but they, oh, have yeah, of, yeah. Uh, they talk a lot about his business successes and individual projects that he did. Like I said, there's a lot of filler about his actual life, which, you know, whatever, it might be interesting to you, not the biggest uh, thing to me, but, um, uh, you know, he, he does talk about how he got started and what he did specifically to make sure he doesn't lose money. As far as oil, a lot of, there's a lot of good books on, they're quite expensive actually, on actual uh, drilling and exploration. There's not a lot of books. In fact, I don't think I've seen any books on investing in actual oil wells in America. There's your book. There's your book, Anton. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, now there's, there's books on investing in pipelines. So there's a lot of, um, that doesn't really happen so much anymore, but, but especially in the 80s, they were doing a lot of trusts where people pulled money together and, and built pipelines which is another aspect of the business. And there's books on that that I've read a couple. Um, but again, it's not really a, a deal that's any longer available. There's already publicly traded companies that are pipeline companies and you can just buy them based on the kind of volume that they're doing, you know, based on that value. Um, you don't really need to read a book about it. You can just, you know, if you know anything about uh, how to value a company, you know, that's a book you should read about. You know, that's a book you should read is how, how to value companies if you're going that route. Willie, and do you have anything that you want to recommend? No, uh, to be honest with you, since this is an oil topic that, I'm, uh, that I find fascinating, I, I think what Anton recommended, the Oil 101 and Warren Buffett's book, um, I think it's called The Snowball Effect. I think those are, are, I guess, perfect to start off, um, you know, your investment career. So, Anton, um, for our listeners, where can they find you? Well, they can go to my company's website, Texas, like the state of Texas, and OGM, texasogm.com. I, I, I have, um, you know, I have uh, Facebook and Twitter, and um, they're kind of commingled with another company that I own. And, Willie, where can people find us? Well, uh, please go to workyourmoney.net. Uh, that's one way you can find us. Go to facebook.com forward slash work your money. Uh, hit us up on our Gmail account, which is work your money podcast at gmail.com. And also on Patreon, where we can use a little donation to keep this podcast going. That's patreon.com. Uh, and then type in work your money. Uh, those are the places you can find us. Um, Anton, you're the man. Thank you so much. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> totally grateful that you were on our show. Not a problem.